Welcome friends of the Crawford Art Gallery to the Autumn Lecture Series and this is the point of the day where I'd usually say to you to check your mobile phones, switch them off and that the emergency exits are behind me to my left and to my right but it's different this time. So instead I'm going to say to you throw on the kettle, put up your feet and join Matthew White inside in the long room for the Stasio Bene. Hello and welcome to the Friends of the Crawford Art Gallery. I'm Matthew White, an art historian from University College Cork, and this morning we're standing in the long room in Stazio Bene, this exhibition which focuses on Cork's maritime history. In this morning's talk, I want to take you through a little journey relating to two works by a fascinating artist from Cork named George Atkinson. Behind me, on my right and on my left, you can see two very different works which explore the different feelings and relationships we have with Cork's port. Painted in the 19th century, we're going to explore how these focus on our diverging relationships with the seascape, with the port which surrounds Cork. So sit back and relax, and I hope that you enjoy this morning's talks. And for our talk this morning, I'm just going to take you through um, two paintings that we have in here, and I'm going to talk about how these paintings situate the artistic tradition that emerges here in Cork within the wider European tradition. This is one of the things actually that I find is most wonderful about the art gallery here. Um, of course we're situated in Cork, we have a collection that speaks to a lot of the traditions that surround Irish art and that surround Cork art. But what I love really about Irish art and what I love about the collection that we have in the Crawford here is that it allows us to explore and to experience how Cork sits and how our artistic tradition sits within the wider European visual tradition. And this is what I want to kind of tease out as we're looking at this exhibition here. Um, curated by Dr. Michael Waldron, um, who's done a fantastic job, of course, as a proud Cork man. He's arranged an exhibition that really speaks to one of the most valuable parts of Cork's history, and that's, of course, our maritime history. You might know that Cork's motto um, throughout history has been Statio Bene Fina Caritas, um, a safe harbour for ships. Cork's port and Cork's maritime tradition is a really inextricable part of understanding the city, um, not only in terms of its culture, but also in terms of its look. One of the things that defines Cork is its natural harbour. We have the second biggest natural harbour in the world, which sets our little island of Ireland, I suppose, apart from many of these bigger nations. Um, and this is really something that allowed Cork as a city, as an economic, and a, as, and a, sorry, as a mercantile hub, to, um, to thrive um, and to be successful. It was once one of the most important ports within the British Empire. It was one of the important outposts for them as a trading nation, and of course that's also true for Ireland as well. So what I'm going to do by looking at, first of all, this painting next to me, and then another painting by the same, by the same, by the same artist, George Wheatley Atkinson, um, I'm going to look at how the port of Cork, how the maritime tradition around Cork, has been expressed by this artist in, very interestingly, especially seeing as it's coming from the same artist, to almost opposite ways, to extremely different ways. And it's not just the kind of aesthetic appearance or the compositional features of the pieces that set them apart, but actually the aesthetic theory that they draw upon. They draw upon a similar aesthetic theory, which I'll pick apart in just a minute, but they do so in, in almost polar opposite ways. So it's very interesting, two completely different experiences of Cork's maritime tradition. And so these situate themselves very well within the context of the exhibition here. We're thinking about Cork as a seafaring port. We're thinking about Cork as a city that's underpinned by water, by people's relationship with water, people's relationship with the port, which of course defines our city. We have a very unique um, city really, it's quite like, um, where's the other place? Montreal in Canada, where the city centre is actually an island in the middle of a river, which breaks apart just to allow that island to form. Um, and so the relationship with water has been so important, not just for Cork people today, but for the evolution of Cork's history. Now what we're looking at here is an artwork by George Monty Wheatley Atkinson. Um, and Atkinson had a very distinctive relationship with the water himself. He spent the first period of his, his adult life actually on ships um, as a seafaring carpenter. When he came back, 
Um, he lived out of Cove. He's born and raised in Cove, so he's born and raised right at the mouth of Cork Harbour. Um, and he worked supervising um, the docks in his later career. And he's actually a self-taught painter, which makes his skill, I suppose, and his output all the more impressive in a way. Um, and this is 19th century art. The year we're talking about here is 1849. So we're the middle of the 19th century. Um, we're post-industrial re post -industrial revolution, revolution um, and we're at a period where, of course, seafaring, overseas trade has boomed, especially with the Industrial Revolution. This was made much more possible um, and much more widespread. It was easier when you had ships that were aided by things like steam power, paddle power, all of these things. And so people coming to terms with this new aspect of culture is something that's often expressed by artists. And then this one, um, a frigate being wrecked off a rocky coast, this draws upon um, real life and also draws upon the imagination. It's modelled off something that would be quite frequently experienced by sailors, most likely by the artist himself when he was on ships, um, but also something that, as I say, is drawn from the imagination, drawn from a literary description, in this case, from a book. But what you're seeing here, as I say, is semi-imaginary, semi-real. We have this rocky coastline which is not unlike that which you'd see around Cove extending out towards Yall, towards Dungarvan, um, up along the sort of southeast coast of Ireland. You see these cliffs, and of course you see them along the west coast of Ireland too, but we're talking specifically about Cork and its tradition here. And you have this ship, which is painted in wonderful detail, um, and especially when you're up close to this painting, you can really appreciate the way that the artist has picked out all of these different um, parts of the rigging of the boat, the various different masts, all of the, um, the ropes and the sheaths and the sails that are attached to that mast. And what we get a sense of here is the, the artist's own experience. Of course, the artist is intimately familiar with these vessels, um, and so this is what he's drawing on. He's drawing upon lived experience. But keeping with that theme of lived experience, this is something that I really want to explore in this artwork and also the next one that we're going to look at after it. We have an image of not just the sea, not just the coastline, um, and not just the ship, but of nature more generally. And that's a very prominent theme in this artwork. It isn't just a depiction of an event. It's not just a depiction of the narrative surrounding the event. But this artwork is as much about the feeling that comes out of the event um, as it is about what's actually happening. And let me kind of explain that a little bit more. If we look at the, the compositional features of the artwork themselves, look at the colours, first of all. It's very striking in this artwork. Really dark colours. When you kind of step back and, and consider it as a whole, it's actually very almost monochrome. You have various different shades of sort of dark purples, dark blues, dark greys, um, dark browns. But the effect, as I say, is is very close to just actually being monochrome. And that very dark undertone gives a sense of foreboding. And of course, that's very deliberate by the artist because we're not looking at a kind of a serene harbour here. We're not looking at a ship that's sort of paddling nicely through um, these little ripples on a sunny afternoon. We're looking at this frigate ship being wrecked off this rocky coast. And the rocky coast, in this case, it takes on almost um, anthropomorphic features, it almost seems like a physical presence, um, a personified presence that's, you know, hulking, a big mass that's looking over this boat that isn't any more inviting in this case than the sea that the boat is actually on, that's being tossed and thrown around on. Um, the artist very cleverly here, if you look at the brush strokes, the brush strokes are incredibly detailed and intricate and he's done a really wonderful job. Remember, this is a self-taught artist. He's done a really wonderful job of um, cresting the waves, using these light flicks of the brush to put these um, white horses, as we call them. Once we hit a gale force four wind, we get these white horses um, on the sea. We're quite a bit past the gale force four here. Um, for any sailors out there, you'd know that. Um, you can see the way he's used this brush really lightly to crest the waves. You know, your worst nightmare when you're sailing a ship is not only just swell, but these waves that are cresting that you have to kind of battle through and duck dive under almost. These long, sort of quick brush strokes, they work really well with the colour. 
because we get that sense of speed and urgency um, and also violence. You know, we can almost kind of feel the wind, look at the sails, the way they're flapping and billowing. Again, any sailor will know, you know, the worst nightmare, this sail that's flapping in the wind um, that's kind of gone outside of your control. Um, that could hit somebody, you know, the, the very real danger is being felt by the people here on the ships. These sheets are getting thrown around like, um, like what they call them, iron cables or steel cables. They're very dangerous. And so all of this works together, the colour, the weather, um, the way the boat is moving, and of course the movement then that's evoked by the paintbrush. All of these come together to give a really distinct feeling, and that's what I think is most interesting about this painting. The period that it's painted in, as I say, 1849, if we think about what was happening in this period, um, first of all, the port of Cork was you know, a very successful port already. It's overly familiar to everybody um, who is from Cork, and so this kind of, um, what would you call it, landscape, this, or seascape really, I should be calling it, this is going to be familiar for those who have experienced the sea, like the artist. So they're going to situate this within something that's very sort of close to home, very personal to them. And of course this heightens the feeling um, on its own. But what's also happening outside of Cork in 1850 or 1849 is the movement known as Romanticism, the literary, um, artistic, philosophical movement that overtook neoclassicism, which defined the Enlightenment at the end of the 18th century. Now what's interesting about these two movements, neoclassicism, Enlightenment and Romanticism, is that they evolved almost concurrently, but they were diametrically opposed to each other. Neoclassicism, which came along with the Industrial Revolution, which came along with the Enlightenment, very interested in rationalism, reason, the power of reason, um, order, principles that you can place over reality, over your knowledge of the world in order to understand it better. Enlightenment, of course, was you know, a scientific revolution as, just as much as it was an artistic and literary one. And so people wanted ways to know the world. People wanted ways to order their perceptions of the world and their knowledge of the world, to reason about it and rationalize it and understand it better, ultimately. Romanticism was pulling in the opposite direction, and it was as much a reaction to the Enlightenment and to industrialization as neoclassicism was, except it was a reaction in the opposite way. Romanticism sought to reclaim the individual in many ways. It sought to re-explore the value of individual experience through exploring things like spirituality, um, through exploring things like feeling and emotion. They weren't as interested in reason and order. They were actually interested in anti-rationalism and disorder. And this is what we're seeing here. This is a brilliant example of a romantic painting. We don't see a perfectly ordered seascape um, which speaks to general ideas like heroism, um, economic success, industrialism. We're ultimately given a painting that appeals to our emotions, that makes us feel what the people on this ship are feeling, that makes us feel what George Atkinson was familiar with himself. And this is a key part of Romanticism. Romantic poets like William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge other Romantic artists like Caspar David Friedrich in Germany um, or Joseph Mallard William Turner in Britain, these artists and these poets, they would go out into nature and they would experience it in order to feel um, what nature had to offer and then in order to imbue their art, whatever that would be, with that feeling. And what feeling we're seeing here is sometimes known as the sublime and this is a key part of Romanticism. The sublime was theorised as that feeling that you extract from an experience of nature. And the sublime was theorized in two different ways. And this is where we'll see the artist explore them in two different ways. The sublime was theorized in the British tradition by Edmund Burke, who focused on the sublime as something which inspires awe and a feeling of terror in the individual. And a British artist, fittingly, um, called Turner, who I just mentioned, Joseph Mallard William Turner, was especially known for his frightening seascapes, playing into that 
aspect of the sublime that appeal to the, the kind of awesome power of nature and the feeling that that evoked in the human being. Turner was actually known to tie himself, now whether or not this is true, it's another story, but this is what was said about him, that he would tie himself to the mast of a ship in order to feel in something like this, in a scene like this, in order to feel the full sort of power of nature so that he could translate it as effectively as possible into his artwork. Maybe George Atkinson didn't do that, but he was certainly on ships and he certainly felt that awesome power of nature. And that is what he's trying to convey here. He's very much giving us what we might call um, a Burkean formulation of the sublime, Edmund Burke's formulation of the sublime. And you can see it in every aspect of this painting. As I say, the brushwork, the colors, the movement, the landscape, the clouds come together. We're possibly given a slight feeling of hope in the way that the clouds are breaking. But the ultimate feeling is that awesome power of nature. And the artist trying to confer that experience onto the viewer. This isn't an enlightenment piece of, pa piece of painting. This is a romantic piece of painting which seeks to appeal to the emotions of the individual. So we might just pop over to the other painting to see how he comes about this in a totally different way. Um, now, so we're back with George Atkinson. We've taken just only a few steps over from the painting we were just looking at. So when you're in this exhibition, visiting it, it's wonderful to be able to see these two paintings side by side. As I mentioned, this one, which depicts a paddle steamer entering the port of Cork, explore some of the same sentiments, but you might be looking at it thinking, but it's so completely different. And you'd be right, it is extremely different. It's the same period, this is 1842, so slightly earlier. It still very much falls quite comfortably in with the, uh, with the movement of Romanticism. But as you can see just from the merest glance at it, it does that in a completely different way. And it makes it so interesting when you compare it with the other painting that we just looked at. Now this is a very familiar sight to any of you that, who are from Cork, which I presume is most of you. Today, of course, if you looked here, you would see a big sign saying Port of Cork. So you know exactly where you are. We're coming up from Black Rock Castle, which is mm, kind of back here somewhere. Um, and we're entering into the Port of Cork. Today now there's many more bridges um, and far fewer masts, unfortunately, because they're quite lovely boats. Now the way that Atkinson is depicting the port here is um, obviously extremely different to how we depicted the rocky coastline in the previous image. What we're seeing here is a very serene, very quiet seascape, something which is almost, you could say, ordered. And that's a dangerous word to use because we know that this is a romantic artist, not a neoclassical artist. But there is a sense of order, or maybe better we could use the word quiet and calm to what we're seeing here. We have that lovely glassy flat water that's just being disturbed by the boat. You can actually see where it was turning by the way the waves are going. And again, this plays into the notion of the importance of the actual experience on the artist's part of what he's depicting. He's obviously looked at this and he's observed this happening because he's depicted very um, accurately the way that the waves, the way the water responds to the movement of a paddle steamer like this. Now this, um, this kind of speaks to the notion of industrialization. Um, it does so in something of a positive way. As you can see, if we look at the port and we look at all these different ships, you can see many of them. It's a very busy port. Um, George Atkinson, of course, was a Cork man and he's showing the port in a way which depicts it in a positive light as something that was successful, something that was burgeoning and busy. Um, and full of activity all the time. This also gives a very wonderful perspective on the Port of Cork, something that you can almost get today if you actually stand here under the Port of Cork sign. We sometimes forget um, the planning, sometimes that's subconscious, that goes into making a city, but we can see it here. When you're entering the port, and this would have been a much more common phenomenon back in the 1800s to be entering the port from the water rather than from the Southlink Road or whatever it is we take in today. Um, you see the prominent buildings, you see City Hall, you see the old St. Finbars, which is not far from receiving its French Gothic renovation at this point in time. That was 1869, I think. If you come over here, you see St. Patrick's. Um, sorry, you see St. Patrick's here. You see St. Mary's up here, I think. 
um, and you see Shandon, and you're entering the port, you see all the most important of the city's landmarks. This is a tradition that goes right back to Renaissance Italy, where you had these towns like Florence that were down in a basin, and when you approach from the hills, all the important buildings stuck up out of the skyline. Same thing is happening here, and he's depicting it um, very accurately. But let's get back to this idea of romanticism. Let's get back to the idea of the artist conferring a particular feeling. Look at the colours and look at the brush strokes here compared to the painting that we just saw. The brush strokes are much kind of longer, you know, they're more languid. There's a sort of a calmness that settles into the use of the brush in this one. It allows for much more detail, of course, but also allows for this feeling of settling. The sun is setting and you can see it rather wonderfully depicted here with a circle of, of slightly more impasto paint. It's just that little bit thicker than the washes that he's giving to the rest of the, um, the, rest of the painting to allow it to stand out and to give it a sense of, of um, presence, texture. What he's showing here is still a seascape. It's still a kind of a depiction of nature, but it's nature at its, um, in its sort of benign persona if that makes sense. This is, of course, altogether different from nature at its most awesome and fearsome and powerful and scary, which is what we saw in the last image. But this makes it no less rom romantic in the sense of romanticism, not in the sense of a kind of a love story. It also makes it no less indicative of this feeling of the sublime. It just comes at it in a different way. And this is what makes it interesting. I mentioned Edmund Burke's formulation of the sublime in the British context. Um, which is something that that artist Joseph Mallard William Turner was very much taken with. And we see elements of Turner here. If you look at some of Turner's watercolours, you'll see the same sort of sepia tones um, and deep, rich reds and blues and things like that. However, the type of approach to depicting the sublime that Atkinson is using here plays much more into the German context, um, coming from a thinker called Immanuel Kant. Kant was a almost direct contemporary of Edmund Burke's, and he formulated the sublime also as a feeling that came from nature, but as one which didn't lead to terror, which ultimately led to a sense of moral and spiritual transcendence. And what I mean by that is, while Edmund Burke sought a feeling that inspired those, I suppose, most resonant emotions in the human, to maybe create the most engaged response or to solicit the most engaged response. Kant here sought something that rose the level of consciousness of the person experiencing nature. Because Kant was also engaged in a much different project which was seeking the progressive enlightenment of the human condition, the progressive, progressive progress of the human condition really. Um, and so he was interested in the sublime as a tool given by nature, which allowed us to raise our minds to these more transcendent matters. And so he was interested in what was called the mathematical sublime. Um, an image of nature which is so vast, and you can see how vast this is, it goes right back beyond the city, right up over the rolling hills of the north side, back even to the horizon and to the sunset. An image of nature that's so vast that when it's viewed, the human being attempt to sort of measure it in relation to themselves, but ultimately realizes that they can't, that it's just too big to comprehend. Now, while that initially gives us a sense of disquiet, that we can't really comprehend just how vast and how expansive this thing that we're seeing is, ultimately, this gives us a feeling of spiritual awakening almost, because we realize that we can reason and we can think about something that ultimately is actually beyond our ability to comprehend. And so it raises our sense of individual power of thought, really, in a sense. And so this is what you're seeing here, a much calmer, um, a much quieter formulation of the sublime, which allows that sort of moral, spiritual, transcendent reflection on the part of the individual viewing it. So it's very interesting, I think, to have two artists, sorry, to have two artists, to have two paintings by one artist who is using the Port of Cork, using what he's familiar with, um, and using what he's experienced himself to explore and to depict two very different aspects, really, of the human condition. 
two very different sets of emotions. Um, and he's using, as I say again, a self-taught artist, he's transitioning almost seamlessly between two very different styles. But of course, at the heart of all of this is the Port of Cork, is Cork's maritime tradition. And so this is something that is lived and breathed and felt by the people of Cork every day. And so, of course, it makes these paintings all the more potent for those who are looking at it and the person who's painting it. And so hopefully the, this short little talk about these two artists, or these artists, I keep saying two artists, these two artworks, this one artist. As I say, this is something that very nicely situates the Port of Cork, but also Cork's visual tradition in the wider European scheme of artistic movements, of overseas trade, of industrialization. So I hope you've enjoyed this and I hope you'll join us again. Um, I believe this is going to be aired on a Friday. I hope you'll enjoy join us again next Friday for our next talk. So good evening, good morning, good afternoon whenever you're watching it and take care.